thanks for joining me. My pleasure. How do you pronounce your last name? Mm. It should be Felzone. So that's Italian. Italian, yeah. yeah. And I, I grew up saying Felzone. Yeah. But my wife, who's not Italian, when uh -huh. we got married, she said, let's make it sound Italian. Yeah. Right? So yeah. Felzone is the way you should say it. Well, I, I, you know, I came to Cornish, I told you, a couple, uh, in two, uh, two different times. One was my first year in college, the second one. Uh, second time was my last year of college. The bookend. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, uh, Ken Deborah, who was the former director of the uh, chair of the music department, he was very supportive. He's actually, yeah, I actually give him credit for kind of helping me start my conducting career. Oh, good. Because he was very supportive in me starting a, a orchestra at Cornish. Uh -huh. And uh, it worked out. We did, and we played at unconventional venues. We actually, Seattle Weekly reviewed our first concert at a bar down the street on Pike, I think. There was a large bar. We played Beethoven's First Symphony <laughs> in the Midcomer Music Number no. 1. And a new uh, young composer from New York, Arshak Andriasa, he, he wrote the uh, kind of an overture called Torch One. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I, Cornish has a special place for good, me. Good, good. I'm glad to hear that. And why, why Cornish? I mean, obviously it's a job and in today's market you want <laughs> to get some jobs. Why Cornish? Yeah, oh, well, great question. Um, the question, I don't mind saying, I'm still asking, you know, yeah. and answering in some ways. But um, obviously I moved my entire life and family and career from yeah. um, Chicago to Seattle, so yeah. something must have been worth it. Um, so I knew about Cornish, its history, its legacy for many years, mm -hmm. uh, starting, of course, with Cage, but also the legacy of jazz mm -hmm. and improvised music mm -hmm. here. Um, I have a friend, Tom Varner, who's been mm -hmm. on this faculty for a number of years, and about three years ago, I was uh, doing a residency at a college in Spokane, and I mentioned to Tom, I've never been to Seattle, I'd love to come through, maybe I could do a workshop at Cornish. He invited me, I did a one workshop for the Creative Ensemble, this would have been about 2015, I think. And I met a lot of the faculty, thought, oh, Seattle's really cool, I played a gig in town here at the Racer Sessions, okay. and met some of the faculty, and just thought, what a great place, yeah. you know, didn't think much else of it. Yeah. Uh, then, a year and a half ago, when I saw that the job of chair was open, I, I remember this first time I saw it, I, it, it made me pause. I thought, that's very intriguing. Like, yeah. I never have thought about myself as the director of a music department or a chair or a dean. Really, it's kind of a dean style position, yeah. really. Um, I've always been a faculty member. I've, I've taught for over 15 years. But I thought to myself, if I could be a chair at, at any place, this is the kind of place that I would be able to do that in. Yeah. A small place, a place that had a real dedication to creativity, to innovation, to, uh, to really dealing with what it means to be in a post-genre era, which yeah. is what I think we are in. Yeah. Um, but also took the training of young musicians seriously and had a legacy and a tradition. Uh, so I pondered it a bit more and threw my hat into the, you know, to the, the search and here I am. Uh, so I moved to Seattle almost a year ago right now late August last yeah. year, and have taken a lot of time to get to know the music community. I've been uh, performing a lot in town, getting to know musicians in town. And my first year of chairmanship really was um, just listening and asking questions and trying to figure out what's happened here mm -hmm. for a long time, you know, 100 years, but yeah. also in the last 5, 10, 15, 20 yeah. years. The place has seen a lot of change, mm -hmm. and I think it needs... Uh, you know, some, some new change. Mm -hmm. Not that the change that's happened previously was bad, it's yeah. just, you know, you have to redefine these things every couple of years. Yeah. You know, it's, there's no other way because music changes so fast, uh, the community changes, the musicianship changes. Uh -huh. So a place that's educating musicians has to change too. Yeah. So I'm here and, uh, you know, I have a lot of ambitions, a lot of hopes, and maybe we can talk about that yeah. uh, for the program. But uh, this year has really just been what is Seattle and what is Cornish? Yeah. You said improv, and that's something that I always ask my guests because as classical musicians, that's something that we shy away from, especially nowadays. Mm -hmm. Back in the day, you know, people improvised their cadenzas and they were more open to it. Why has this happened? Why, why do you think classical musicians... Mm. I mean, it's, it's, you know, there's a lot of classical musicians who do improvise, but why, in, you know, yeah. why don't they try? Wow. So this is a... This is my life's work. I don't yeah. mind saying improvisation is my main, uh, the main work that yeah. I do. So I, I, um, I saw that. Yeah. So I mean, I I was my undergraduate work was in classical clarinet performance, but uh, 
ever since I picked up the clarinet at age 10, I've been interested in improvisation from every vantage point, jazz, different kinds of world music traditions, and as you say, curious about the absence of it in the history of classical music, right? So I think that the um, absence of improvisation in conservatory training is part of the uh, European, European white focused, white focus of training of musicians, mm -hmm. right? So if we focus only on the Western canon, and we focus on this very narrow uh, moment in the Western mm -hmm. canon, which really, when you get to the conservatories, you're talking about the you know sort of late 18th to the maybe 20th, middle of the 20th yeah. century. Yeah. It's a short amount of time, yeah. you know. Um, and though we know that Bach was a great improviser yeah. and Mozart was a great improviser, it's very easy to not concentrate on that when you've got. 40 some odd symphonies of Mozart to learn, right? Yeah. 40 something symphonies. And you've got lots of Bach to, you know, there's so much to deal with. So that's an easy thing to just dismiss. Yeah. And if you don't, and, and as jazz has become more uh, part of the education system, it was easy to say, oh, well, they do that. We don't have to worry about that here. You know? And I don't, I'm going to say a bold statement, I, I don't trust a, a musician who can't improvise. Yeah. I'm not interested in working with them. <laughs> that's, that's, no. that's interesting you say that because there's so many uh, orchestral musicians that would not be able to do it. But I would offer that they can. I think it's there. They're afraid. Right. They're afraid. Yeah. yeah. And so I do a, a number of workshops in which I, I get classical musicians to improvise. And they're, they're brilliant at it. Yeah. They have the skills. They have the knowledge. It's just it's, there's certain blocks that have come up. I'm afraid I'm going to play the wrong note. Well, they're... There's not, it's not possible, yeah. right? So I'm, af I'm afraid I, d I don't, I don't, I'm not able to reach what I'm hearing in my ear mm -hmm. on my instrument, you know. So there's some things that have been sort of drummed out of them, right? But I'm, I think that you can unleash some of that in students, in, in classical musicians, yeah. whether they're students or professionals. So I mean, I, I'm being you know, hyperbolic when I say I'm not interested in working with non-improvisers. But uh, to me, an improviser, even if that's not part of their practice, mm -hmm. like if they are just an orchestral musician, really, that's their love, that's what they do well. If they have the ability to improvise, it makes them a better orchestral yeah. musician. When you're sitting in the second chair violin section, but you have ears that are open to everything that's going on around you, and not just the notes flying by you on the page, you are a better second yeah. violinist. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So my interest is training. I, I don't ever want to see a musician graduate from Cornish who cannot improvise. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean that they're going to go off and be jazz players or improvisers, but it's part, just like I wouldn't want to see somebody who doesn't know what a triad is, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> or who doesn't know who Bach or Thelonious Monk are, yeah. I also don't want them to, to be afraid of improvisation. Yeah. And from a purely career standpoint, contemporary chamber music, I don't know as much about orchestral music, but contemporary chamber music, what composers are writing, often asks for improvisation. Yeah. Not in a jazz idiom, not even in, in an uh, idiomatic yeah. way, but just saying, here's a cell of pitch material, please create a, a, a texture for the yeah. next 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. Right? That's improvisation, a kind of improvisation. Yeah. So purely from a career standpoint, we need students to come out of music schools who can do that, because yeah. composers want them to be able to do that. Well, you said post-genre era. What mm. is this post-genre era? Yeah, I, I think we're in it. I, I really do. I think we've been in it for a while. Yeah. But I think we, we need to, to stop talking about classical music, jazz, pop music, hip hop, world music, these yeah. kinds of things. You know, and just, just, I mean, I recognize that these things help us in labels like record stores and on yeah. iTunes or whatever. Do record stores even exist? They still <laughs> exist, right? <laughs> iTunes, you know what I mean. Uh, Spotify, etc. But in terms of thinking about what Contemporary music is, mm -hmm. right, uh, VJ Iyer, the great jazz yes. pianist, who was just the artistic director of the, um, I was not, I don't know how to say the name of it, the uh, music festival in California, Omaji, or yeah, Omaji, yeah, yeah. I think. Um, he was the director this year. I mean, talk about a range of things, yeah. right? From straight up classical music to contemporary music mm -hmm. that's being written today blending jazz and improvised music with things. He had George Lewis, the great trombonist and scholar from the AACM, doing some things. I mean, just obliterated yeah. genres on the stage every night. Yeah. Right? So 
that to me is the epitome of my own personal work. You know, in any given month, I might play Messiaen, I might be in a free jazz setting, I might play some French music from Brittany, I might play Arabic music, and that might happen, and those are performances that I have with my own ensembles, or I'm asked to do those kinds of things, or things that I've organized. And that's the way I want it. I want to be back and forth between all those things. Yeah. And that's the way I want to be thinking of a music school. Yeah. So, to, to me, the, the faculty and the students and the administration here will hear me saying post-genre all the time, yeah. because I truly believe that we can no longer just have a jazz program yeah. and a classical program. And you know, some schools will even sort of try to, to say, okay, now we have a contemporary world music uh, major, but then all you do is just, you're just setting up silos yeah. in which people have to go in yeah. to matriculate through those. So what I'm offering and suggesting is this much wider way of coming so as of this year, when you, have, when you audition or apply to Cornish, you don't have to check a box about jazz, classical, one okay. any longer. You're just giving us what you do. Yesterday, in this very room where you're sitting, I was meeting with a young girl from Portland and her family who wants to apply to Cornish. Well, what do you do? Well, I play mandolin. Mm -hmm. Oh, tell me about what kind of music. I play choro. I play Irish music. Uh, I also play drums in a jazz, gr mm -hmm. jazz group, and I am also a singer-songwriter and have my own band, and I have a band camp page, and, you know, like, we're, that would not have come up 10, 15 years ago, right? She plays choro. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she plays Irish music. Yeah. She's playing jazz, uh, jazz drums. Yeah. She's a singer-songwriter. She's had a couple years of music theory, so she really knows she's not coming in as just not having read music. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's the musician, the music student of the future. Yeah. So music schools who are interested in educating those kinds of musicians. Now, her, her name is Stella. Stella's not going to wind up at Curtis Institute. Yeah. Right? They're not even going to let her in the door. That's fine. I, I'm, I would love to have her here. You know? She, she'd be a welcome asset to this program. Yeah. And, and to me, that's the kind of musician that I'm interested in 20 years from now. Yeah. What's Stella going to be up to? She's yeah. going to be doing some cool stuff. Yeah. You know? Um, so there's places for Curtis. I mean, we need that, we need those kinds of places, you know, to fill your orchestra. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but I, that's not what I think Cornish needs to be. Yeah. Um, well, uh, how did you come to this mindset? How did you learn how to do all these different things? What were the ex what were your experiences to bring you to the point that you are at? I would say there's three pivotal things. Um, the first is my uncle. I have an uncle who was a, uh, is a wonderful composer. Mm -hmm. He's a film composer. Uh, had a very successful career um, and also a great saxophonist mm -hmm. and, uh, and jazz musician. And so when I first announced that I wanted to play the clarinet when I was 10, he kind of took me under his wing. Mm -hmm. And he lived in LA, but he would come to Chicago for holidays. And he would always take me to the record store and, uh, and buy me, usually, I, I can remember five, vinyl records. Every time we went, he'd buy me five records. Mm -hmm. The first time we went, I remember very specifically, he bought me uh, Stravinsky's Firebird, mm -hmm. uh, Charlie Parker with Strings, the Beatles' White Album, Josquin Dupre, uh, Renaissance Music, yeah. and a Stevie Wonder record. Wow. Right? So I was 10. Wow. <laughs> so, it, and he didn't say, okay, this is jazz, this is classical, this, he just said, this is all kind of my favorite stuff, check it out. Yeah. yeah. And he, I had a record player, and I just listened, and I thought, that really sounds cool. Stevie Wonder, oh, that's fun to dance to. And yeah. Charlie Parker, wow, listen to that saxophone. And wow, Stravinsky, wow, listen to those rhythms. I, did, I didn't know anything yeah. about music yet. I was just, my ears were just saturated with sound. Mm -hmm. So, and he did that a lot for me. And he just had a very kind of ecumenical way of looking at music. And I'm, I'm very grateful for that. So that would be the first, I think, uh, impulse for me. The second is just a curiosity that I have as a human being. Like, I'm just, I'm interested in pretty much everything. Yeah. So when it comes time to be interested in music, I'm, if it's music, I'm in. You know, like, I, I'm not, I don't say that's not my thing or I don't like that. I'm, I'm, I'm just interested. Yeah. So um, that kind of inquisitive nature is, um, is part of what I brought to music studies. Um, and then, so that was my earliest training. Uh, and the clarinet allows you to do a lot of different things, right? So I could play in an orchestra, I could play jazz, I could learn about uh, you know, the, 
history of the clarinet in Arabic music, of course, klezmer yeah, music, yeah. etc., Turkish music. Yeah. Right. Um, so the clarinet was a great vehicle. Yeah. Uh, I didn't even know it at the time. I just chose it because I thought it looked cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and there I was with an instrument that allowed me that kind of fascination. And then uh, capping all of that off, that, that was all like my own way of exploring, but the thing that tied all that in was graduate studies at the New England Conservatory mm -hmm. in their contemporary improvisation program, yeah. where I worked with Rand Blake and, and uh, Bob Lavery and uh, many teachers and scholars mm -hmm. who just allowed me to academically and, and in a scholarly way investigate these things. Yeah. So that's where I went from, you know, in one class studying Messiaen to the next class looking at Gregorian chant. Yeah. In the next class, I was in a Rada Tala class. Yeah. And that's when I've, I've said, oh, this isn't, this isn't just cool or interesting. I can actually study this as a scholar yeah. as a, and make this my life's pursuit. Yeah. You, know? you know, I had a teacher in high school, a flute teacher, who went, who did that program, Laura, oh. Laura Osborne. Oh, sure, I know who that is. Uh, are you serious? Yeah, <laughs> I do. Yeah. Uh, that's funny. And also, Aaron Larger Kaplan, yes. who, who when I tweeted that you were going to be my guest, he said, I said, does anyone have questions? He responded, he said, how is he digging the West Coast? <laughs> uh, does he still play You Are My Sunshine? <laughs> okay, so that's interesting. So Aaron's a great, great guitarist. He was one of my guests. Okay, yeah. beautiful. Um, I haven't seen him in a while. We, you know, Facebook allows us to keep up with one another, but I haven't seen him. Um, okay, so I confess I have no memory of playing You Are My Sunshine, and I have no idea what he's referring to. <laughs> I thought it was an inside joke or maybe something, but... Yeah, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on that. Uh, so, I don't remember that, but uh, the, answering his question about the West Coast, I'm, I'm digging it quite hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm enjoying Seattle very much. Seattle's a really creative music community. Um, I'm enjoying the beauty of the, of the Pacific Northwest, although yeah. today with this, this smoke, you can't even see the mountains out the window. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's a real cultural shift from mm -hmm. Chicago. You know, Chicago is a much more kind of aggressive place. Yeah. And it's taken me a minute to realize that, um, that aggression doesn't come off the same way here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like some of the ways I interact with people, yeah. people here are like, um, is this guy, what's this guy talking about? You know? <laughs> but I've, I've been enjoying that. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, we've gotten out to some of the islands, uh, up to Canada, and yeah. so I'm digging it plenty. Well, a, a question that always uh, com comes to mind, and I, don't, I, I think about it a lot, what can artists do in general to, to make music more accessible to the youth, to mm -hmm. the general public, mm -hmm. to get more people interested in what we do? Mm -hmm. what, what can we do as artists? Uh, I mean, there, sometimes there are first-time listeners first time concert goers and they come out and sometimes they don't have the best experience. What can yeah. we do to make it better? Because, you know, sometimes we tend to blame the audiences or maybe not the audiences, but the educational system of how they're not, they, they, they don't know much about music, whether it's classical jazz or the post era, post yeah. genre. Well, what can we do to make it a better experience for them and, and, and reach out to them better in, in new ways maybe? It's a great question, and of course there's no real answer that I can give other than some of the things that have worked in my own life, um, and some of the ideas that I have, but it's something we all have to be doing together. Mm -hmm. And I want to amplify what you said, that we tend to blame the education system. You know? And I want to start there, because I do think there is a little truth to that, the education system even as music educators for young children, I think we've done some disservice. So I think we, the kind of, going back to our earlier question about improvisation, young children are discouraged from improvising yeah. often. What's the first thing you do when you start studying violin at age seven or eight is somebody puts a book in front of you, yeah. starts working on, here's how you gotta do your shifting. Yeah, of course. And I have a daughter who's studying violin, she's, um, 12 now, but some of her earliest studies, and she was frustrated by, by this, and um, I get it, I get why we need to have a student do those things, but she's also now learning fiddle tunes, and she's uh, experiencing the kind of like wider breadth of what it means to play music, and she's practicing more, yeah. she's, she's more in, like, entrenched in the study of music, so I think first and foremost is that music educators need to to stop being so small-minded yeah. 
at the earliest ages. Now, there's funding cuts and they're not paid well, and so when you've got the students for 20 minutes in the music class, like, what are you gonna do, right? So, so if you've got those students for 20 minutes, maybe instead of trying to teach them how to read, maybe teach them all a song, or get them improvising, or introduce them to Sun Ra. Yeah, yeah of course, of course. <laughs> You know, or introduce them to, um, to, to, to a piece of music, introduce them to something of Beethoven's and like explore it and, yeah. and, and really engage it. And I think if, if young people, if a generation of young people are having a more ecumenical, thoughtful way of engaging music, whether they become musicians or not, when they come to your concert or my concert, they have a different way of approaching it, you know, a much more open-minded way of approaching it. And, um, you know, I, I'm a homeschooler. My, my wife and I homeschool our children, and we have three kids. And, you know, I, I, I take a little pride, I have to say, in that my kids, they'll go to a concert. I've brought them to many concerts here. And they'll come away saying, well, Dad, you know, I didn't necessarily like that, but it was kind of cool the way this thing happened yeah. or whatever. And, yeah. and, you know, I try to expose them to a lot of stuff. But what I think I've engendered in them is a sense of, of discovery. Like, there's something to discover. Even if I might not have enjoyed the full experience, it doesn't mean it wasn't worth my time, yeah. wasn't worth doing, wasn't worth engaging in. You know? um, that's the kind of, that's who I want at my concerts. Yeah. I, I'm not there to entertain them, personally. That's the way I yeah. make music. Um, in an art concert, I mean, if I'm like playing a wedding, it's different. But <laughs> but if I have a chance to put a concert on, I'm thinking more about uh, expression and art than I am thinking about entertainment. Yeah. So what do I want them to do? I want them to come in with a sense of discovery. Yeah. I don't think they're going to enjoy every moment, every note, every sound. Yeah. Just like I don't enjoy every note, every moment, every sound. Yeah. You know, in an art course. So um, so there's that. Um, then I, th I think there's some things we can do to break down some of the, um, the barriers, especially in quote-unquote classical music. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think applause between um, pieces and bowing is, should just be done with. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's like, like, you know, the, the kind of like, okay, here's the, uh, the Brahms, and then they come out and they play Brahms, and then they bow, and they go off stage, yeah. and you change the stage for the next piece, and they come out, and they bow, and they yeah. play, and then they bow again. There's, like, there's like, not much natural in that. Like, there's, it's stupid. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it, is, it is completely not what any of us do in life. It's what yeah. we don't experience, yeah. right? Um, it's, it's just something that I think makes people feel like, oh, I'm doing something cultured, yeah. right? I'm uninterested in people feeling cultured. Yeah. I'm interested in them experiencing music. Yeah. You know? um, that whole notion of like going to the opera, going to the ballet, going to the symphony yeah. is like this high culture thing. Let's, let's be done with that. And, and, and it, it pushes people away from what we do. You know, how many times I've talked to people that say, you know, I, I, I am not educated enough to attend your concerts. Even oh. some, some, some family or cousins, you know, I, I don't understand it, so I don't go to that type yeah. of stuff. Right. You're, you're so, and, and you know, they, they say you're so great and we love what you do, you're so, you're so good at what you do, but yeah, it's not something I could, I could be part of. So it's, it pushes people away totally. where yeah. it shouldn't because the music, what we do, whether you want to give it genres or not, it's, it's, it's a place for people to come together and maybe learn something about something new or just explore something that they've never thought yeah. exists or even happens on a stage. I'm totally with you. And I think we can do some things along those ways of trying to break out of the traditional um, concert venues, yeah. you know? There's a group in town here, Emerald City Music, mm -hmm. the Chamber Music yeah. Ensemble. They're doing some great stuff like at a place where you can have a drink yeah. and so you can go and hear, and they're not doing all contemporary music, they're doing Brahms and Schubert and all that stuff. But you can sit down, have a beer, and yeah. listen to the Trout Quintet. Yeah, you know, like that to me is—that's how I want to listen to that music. That's probably how how it was written, written yeah. with intention. You know, a couple of years ago, maybe ten years ago, I was teaching a music appreciation class in uh, at a liberal arts college in Chicago, and I was playing the students um, a piece of Schubert, uh, the one about the hair, um, the spinning wheel uh, one. You know that? Yeah. I, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. I can't. I should, um, Gretchen at the Spinning Wheel. Oh, I see. Okay. And beautiful song, you know, a beautiful uh, art song. And I played it, and I said, so, I made the mistake that a lot of educators say. I said, so what do you guys think? 
Just never a good question because yeah, yeah. it's just too open ended. But I was a young teacher, so I said, "What do you guys think?" And there's a, about 25 students in the room, and uh, this African American student from the West Side of Chicago raised his hand and said, "It's rich white people's music." Huh. And I remember I was just speechless huh. because he's totally right. Yeah. Now he's wrong. It's not rich white people's music. That's not what it was written for, yeah. right? But it's how it's marketed. Yeah. The the station in Chicago, WFMT, a wonderful classical music station that does all kinds of other things too. If you listen to that station on a given day, what do you hear for advertisements in between classical music? You hear things like wealth management companies. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have barnacles on your yacht? This company yeah. can bring you know, yeah. that, that kind of stuff, right? So who are they marketing to? Rich white people. Yeah. So when I was able to break down that song for these students and say, I know you think it's this, but let's look at what why this was written. Let's look at the anguish this woman is talking about yeah. about her lover dumped her, yeah. and she's sitting at this spinning wheel, and something about the rotation of the spinning wheel makes her think about this lover, yeah. and listening to the piano imitating the spinning wheel, and I looked up and he was like, Yeah, yeah, you know, like I've been dumped. I know what yeah. that feels like, yeah. right? So. I think this this whole like notion of that this is high cultural music, that's a big way to to, to get over that, yeah. right? And I I'm I'm afraid of what jazz how jazz is trying to do that now too. Yeah, right? and it's funny you said that because I talked about this thing with Christian McBride, the bass player. Oh yeah, and and he he, he was talking. I asked him. I said, why why is jazz going in the same direction that classical was before, and it didn't. Get classical musicians anywhere. Mm -hmm. It didn't. It didn't. It didn't get them more audience. It didn't do anything. And now jazz is going in that same direction. Why? What was his response? Did, did well, he, well, he he was just he, he agreed and he was just he said it's it's unfortunate that it goes in that direction, but he just I don't think he really had a response. Well, I, you know, calling jazz America's classical music was probably a first mistake. Yeah. <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah. It's like it's like trying to make jazz into European music. Yeah. I don't even know what. What the sense is like? Why? Good, the, what that does is it attempts to give validity to jazz yeah. in a time in which it wasn't getting the validity, uh, you know, in music schools or anywhere else. So uh, um, now this isn't to say that I think jazz should remain on the street and in the bars or no. whatever. I, I'm just uh, what I'm interested in is liberating music from any kind of expectation. Yeah. And person who who started these volleys in the 1930s, 40s, 30s and 40s was John Cage, who who worked in this very building, yeah. you know, who created the Perry Piano piece is probably downstairs from us right yeah. now. Um, you know, he's somebody who encouraged us to think about music and sound as not having baggage attached to it. Yeah. You know, that these sounds, that this this work, that this art could exist on its own, to not bring judgment to it, to just enjoy the sound and the work for what it was, yeah. you know. Um, and I think that kind of mentality really, really helps. Yeah. What your relatives say to you, which mine do too, my mom always says, you know, I don't understand your music. Huh. And I say, well, what music do you understand? And she said, well, I love Mozart. I'm like, you understand Mozart? Because tell me, I, I, it's very complicated music. Yeah. Like, <laughs> explain it to me, right? It's not that she understands it, of course, because she's not a trained musician. It's, it's that she has experience with it. Yeah. She's visited it, it many times over. It's put into a setting in which she feels comfortable, etc. So when she comes to some funky gallery space to hear a group of mine that's improvising in some weird way, uh, it, it's just not landing for her. But it's not about understanding. Yeah. It's not because you and I are really smart or cultured <laughs> or educated. You know, like it's because the of, uh, amount of experience. You know. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's uh, going back to improvisation, I, I just remembered an experience I had with my youth orchestra. I had a violinist, Andrew Jocelyn, who, came, sure. yeah, yeah. who came to Bainbridge Island to work with one, one of my youth orchestras for our festival. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I said, can we somehow incorporate improvisation with the orchestra? So we, we just had kids, I had kids play, you know, a couple of chords, and I told them what to play. Mm -hmm. And we had kids come up to the front and improv. Yeah. And I was just absolutely shocked at how well they did. Yeah, young course, kids. Yeah. And and the great thing was, I've tried this with the university or orchestra, and it didn't work so well because they've got a lot more baggage on yeah. them by then. And, and these kids, so. they they played some notes, and even when 
some of the notes didn't fit in the chord. I didn't see some weird faces. It was just they continued playing. They yeah. just had a good time. It was absolutely one of the most amazing experiences for me to see those kids improv. Yeah. Well, it's also a great pedagogical tool. Yeah. Improvisation puts a, connects us to our instruments or to our voices in very intimate yeah. ways. If you want to base the improvisation in some kind of har harmonic or formal um, framework, you're dealing with harmony and modality and form. Uh, most classical musicians often can't play in a groove, right? So if you set up an improvisation that has some kind of a groove yeah. to it, it forces them to start thinking about rhythm in a yeah. new way. So improvisation works on all these things at once. It's a, it's a tremendous pedagogical tool. It should be there from the very beginning uh, of, of a musician's life. Yeah. You lead a music department now, and what would you say as artists, what, what, when we lead a school of music, what can we do? What's a 21st century artist like? What, what jobs can they have? How they, sh how they should approach the whole situation? Because it's a tough place, you know? Yeah. If, you're, if you're thinking just about one job, landing an orchestra job, or teaching at a college, you probably have not, don't have too many options. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, it's funny you mentioned this, because three weeks ago, I went to the Aspen Music Festival to do a, um, to, you know, to do like a, um, a recruiting event for okay. Cornish. And I was sitting next to a young woman who was representing Colburn School of Music okay. in LA, which is a you know straight up conservatory yeah. uh, for classical musicians. And I, she's a violist, and I said to her, um, so you know, project ahead ten years from now. It's it's uh, 2027. What do you see yourself doing? And she said, without even like hesitating, we're playing in an orchestra. And I just thought to myself, said, of course I said, that's wonderful, awesome, you know, you know, keep on going, keep on practicing, whatever. I tried to be encouraging, but in my mind I was thinking, has anybody explained to her how hard that's going to be? Now, she, I'm sure she was thinking, playing in an orchestra, I'm sure she was thinking, you know, uh, the CSO in Chicago or the LA Philharmonic or the New York Phil or yeah. the Seattle Symphony, but probably she's going to be playing in regional orchestras. Yeah. And that doesn't pay the bills. It does not pay the bills. Now, you direct them. They're wonderful. I've written for them. I love regional community orchestras. Uh, they're an important part of the fabric of, of uh, you know, the musical and cultural landscape. Uh, but that's not what she's thinking, right? So what I'm hoping is that Colburn also, in some way, is, is reminding her about that she has narrowed her, uh, her job accessibility to a very small window. Can she do it? I hope so. You know, I hope she's playing viola in the New York film. Yeah. But, but more than likely, she'll be playing in a variety of other contexts, yeah. right? So the question for her, for this young woman, is is she ready to do other things as she's trying to fit into that small slice, right? So what does that entail? For most of us, that entails teaching. Yeah. When I was at uh, the New England Conservatory, I worked for two years in the Career Resources Center which uh, was after my, my graduate studies, and I worked with a woman named Angela Beeching, who wrote a great book called uh, Beyond Talent, which is a really good book about thinking about these issues. And I remember Angela did a kind of survey of, uh, for NEC students about when they graduated, how many thought they would be teaching in their careers? Very small percent, four or five percent said I'll be teaching. Do the same study for grads, about 10 years later, alums, how many of them are teaching? 99% are teaching in some capacity. Wow. It's, and, and why shouldn't that be a noble thing? Who else is gonna pass down the, the work, the tradition, the thinking to the next generation yeah. than us, right? So I see it as a great thing. Well, actually, the New York Times, I don't know if you know, uh, if you know the article, but a few years ago, and I've said this a few times during my talks, uh, they came out with an article talking to uh, Juilliard grads mm. that wanted a career, but and, and talked to people who were so disappointed that they couldn't get a job, they ended up doing other careers, yeah. all kinds of different careers. And actually, another thing, talking to a friend from the East Coast, she was saying how, you know, she's going to concentrate hard on the orchestral music world, and when it doesn't happen, when she feels that she can't do it, then she'll pursue other opportunities like teaching. But I mean, and she'll probably listen to this because she follows, but do we really need people like that teaching? And I've asked her this question. I've yeah, asked her this right. question in a very honest way. I mean, do, do we need people like that? That, and I, and I hope she doesn't get upset, but <laughs> do we need people like that to teach 
because if, if they're gonna if they're not gonna be all 100 percent in in teaching the future generations then I mean there are people who will give 100 percent and they will give the care and passion and energy to these kids right so even if they uh, you know end up doing other things in their life even if it's not music they're gonna be the supporters the concert goers for our music if yeah. we just kind of not care for them in this setting yeah teaching and and so that person your friend um, if if she has that mindset for teaching, she'll fall into the same traps of teaching, the same, in my opinion, conservative, non-helpful teaching. Those traps that a lot of people fall into, yeah. right? So improvisation would never end to it because she wasn't trained as an improviser because she wasn't exposed to it. She'll, she'll fall into many of the same traps that create that narrow window, that narrow door of what music is in society yeah. for her students. Yeah. And then her student will perpetuate that, yeah. and it'll keep going. And we have to break that cycle. So now I'm sure she's a wonderful musician and a great person. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, my, she is. Yeah. yeah. So my encouragement, if you're listening, my encouragement is is think about everything. Yeah. Right. Think about everything. And and music schools have to encourage students to think about all these things. So one of the things I'm doing here right now is in discussion with one of our faculty members, who's a great teacher, who goes around the country. Uh, offering pedagogy classes to develop a pedagogy class that'll be, if not required, it'll be a, a real serious part of our curriculum here. So that every student has a chance to learn how to teach, to think about teaching, because we know they're going to be doing it in the future. Right? Um, so I agree, we, we don't want to perpetuate those kinds of things. Yeah. So going back to your, your, your original question, you know, we have to prepare musicians to be ready for everything and anything mm -hmm. and that's a tall pursuit so the so we know we can't do it i can't prepare my students to do everything clearly right you gotta play jazz you gotta play you know you gotta be able to play uh macomb from <laughs> you gotta be able to play uh, you know indian music no we can't do that uh, but we can give them uh, foundational skills well-rounded foundational skills and educate them broadly so that they are ready for the journey of, of discovering their calling in music. Yeah. Right? And I use that term a lot, vocation or calling. Vocation, you know, the, the root of that word is vocare, which means the voice. Yeah. Right? So vocation, I think, is what we all have to be about. Uh, you know? And sure, I think a vocational calling in life could be to play in an orchestra. Absolutely. That's, that's, I, I love this music. I'm speaking like somebody else. I love this music, this repertoire. I love being with 60 other musicians and a conductor. I'm dedicating my life to this work. But that doesn't mean we can't also be doing many other things yes. and involved in many other things. And because it's rare that a musician will be able to support themselves strictly from an orchestral job. Yeah. It happens, but it's, it's pretty rare. And some of the best orchestral musicians that I know, I'm thinking of uh, a friend, Katinka Klein, who's a cellist in the Chicago Symphony. Katinka, is a, you know, she's in there as one of the best cellists playing in the CSO. Yeah. She's a young woman from, from, the, from the Netherlands. She's a great improviser. Mm -hmm. She's got a, like a loop effects thing on her cello that she does. Uh, I've played with her in many improvised contexts. She plays a lot of new music, um, does a lot of stuff electronic music. I mean, that's a contemporary orchestral musician. She holds down this job as an orchestral player because she wants to and because it's a great job and she's doing so much else for the music community in Chicago and around the world because she's a great, great player. So that to me is, is a big part of what artists need to be, how they need to be thinking. Yeah. Well, orchestras are folding. You know, Santa Barbara Chamber Orchestra was one of the latest orchestras that didn't survive. I know it's a broad question, but what's what's the future? Or you know, classical music, jazz. Well, I mean, where is it going? You've been around for a while, and you've seen the shifts, maybe a little bit, mm -hmm. but and you know a little bit about the history and maybe some of the shifts. But wh where is this going? Where is our genre going? Well, so I don't know what our genre is. So just, just <laughs> the, whatever just music, the, the yeah. post, post yeah. genre, yeah, right. Yeah, right. You know, uh, obviously, it's um, it's impossible to to understand and to know. The things that I'm thinking about right now are: what does it mean to be a post-genre musician? So, what does that mean? You've got to be versed in every genre. No. 
that means you have to have a kind of open-mindedness about music making that I think we are ready for. That the culture, the music industry, the way the whole kind of society works right now, it's never been a better time than to have this kind of uber musician who's ready to enter into that. Who can sit in an orchestra and read down what needs to be read down, who can also improvise, who is also a composer, who plays cello on a singer-songwriter record, whatever, you know, that kind of uh, just, you know, open-minded musician. I think we are ready for more and more and more of that. And so that to me is the definition of, of, of what's important thinking ahead. So right. I'm thinking a lot about like training those musicians and, and being one of those musicians and supporting musicians like that. I'm also thinking about the the breaking down of this divide between art music and pop music. Yeah. You know, I spent some time recently with Ryan Lewis, who's okay. the producer from yeah. Macklemore. Um, lovely guy, and uh, we spent a lot of time talking about that divide. And it would be really exciting to see that divide breached. Yeah. Now, Ryan, and, and his with his work, has employed a whole lot of Cornish musicians. Of course, yeah. You know, that, yeah. Um, he's got this new tune that's like all over the place with Kesha. Uh, it's called Prayer, I think. Yeah, Prayer. And the piano is all by one of our grads, Josh Rollins, right? So you probably yeah, know Josh, yeah. 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 Um, so now Josh was a jazz pianist, but here he is on this pop yeah. tune, right? So I'm interested in these conversations. You know, how can we think together about music without this high art, low art divide. Um, now, the, the intentions of Kesha's latest single and my latest record are completely different, right? Uh, I'll be excited if I get, you know, 50 likes, uh, 50 views on, on, uh, on YouTube and, you know, her, her latest one is on like 12 million. Yeah. So, so, you know, d different ideas about what's intended here, but I think we can have this conversation in ways we've never had before. I'm a musician that doesn't think that Ryan, for instance, or Macklemore, for that matter, are, I don't think of them as like non-musicians. You know, I think of them as part of the fabric of music. So I want to have a discussion with them. And I think they can learn from us, and we can learn from them. Of course. And, and even about just learning, it's about like making music. Yeah. So, so that's on my mind too. I think that's part of the future. Yeah. Uh, in some way that I can't figure out, in some way that I don't fully understand. But, um, you know, and there's a lot of, in my opinion, kind of silly and stupid things like orchestras like trying to play like a hip hop tune or whatever. You know, like, I, I, I'm, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about like real discussion yeah. about what it means to study this music and to be thinking about music. A music history class that incorporates hip hop into the study of music, and there's and there's good hip hop, and there's good in everything, and there's bad in everything. When we yeah. think of classical or even jazz now, most people associate with that some with with uh, some great music, right? And there's nothing bad in that. Yeah. But there's some terrible classical composers and terrible jazz and jazz yeah. music. So so. There's good and bad in everything. It's just it's it's terrible how everything is just so one-sided yeah. sometimes. You know, even hip hop. You think of hip hop, most academics would say, ah, that's terrible music. You don't want to be listening to that. Yeah, right. <laughs> but there's there's great artists out there. I I love that. What I heard one time, I went to a Chicago Symphony concert years ago, and it was a, a piece by, by Harrison Bird Whistle mm -hmm. that was being premiered. And the first half of the concert was uh, a Bach double oboe concerto. Mm -hmm. And after the concert, there was a Q and A that I stayed for, and this man got up and he was just, just lambasting Bert Whistle, who was there, and saying, you know, your music is ugly, and I, I, I don't know why I had to sit through that, in comparison to the Bach, which was just lovely, and I just enjoyed every moment of it, you know, and that's good music, and and Bert Whistle was really, he handled it perfectly. He said, you know, my dear fellow, uh, thank you for saying these things, like. It's like, I can't speak about my own music, you liked it or you didn't like it, but I can tell you that that was second-rate Bach. Wow. You know, he's like, he said, I know Bach, and I love Bach. That was not Bach at his best. Wow. And he was absolutely right. You know, like, there's a lot of Bach we play, listen to, that's 
I bet if Johan was here, he'd be like, oh man, I, I got that out just like in 24 hours because I needed to get it done. Like, why are you playing that? Yeah. Like, you know, there's fascination with the past and there's fascination with certain individuals from the past. Totally. That we just think they're all, and the same thing in jazz, yeah. you know, there's a lot of Coltrane that I think does not need to be listened to. Yeah. And I think Coltrane probably would agree, yeah. you know. Um, now, it's fascinating because it's Coltrane, and so I want to hear everything yeah. and every note, and I'm interested. Yeah. But, you know, there are tunes or, or performances that you just think, that's not him at his best. Like, I don't need to listen to that, yeah. you know? Um, I think it's the same with all the great yeah. composers, and let, let alone how many composers we don't speak about, because the canon has just not been defined around them. Yeah. It's a fascinating thing to study about why these, this group of people has been, have been the ones we discuss. Yeah. And now we know it's been at the expense of a lot of women yeah. who we should be talking about, whose music was suppressed. We know that later on in the 19th and 20th centuries is at the expense of a lot of people of color that yeah. we've never spent time with. I had the great fortune to do some work at the Center for Black Music Research in Chicago and, and got a chance to, to really look at the scores of a lot of great black composers during the early 20th century whose music never got played. Yeah. And I'm looking at it going, that is equally as good as Hindemith. Yeah. Why am I not hearing that? Yeah. But I have to hear every Hindemith piece that ever gets written. And I love Hindemith, yeah. but you, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, of course. And I thought I had the great honor to speak to George Walker, who wrote, you know, he, he, he did so many things. I mean, I, I was reading, when I was talking to him, I was reading all the, all the different things he has accomplished. You know, the first black composer to uh, get a doctor from Eastman, the yeah. first person to graduate from Curtis, the first person to, the first black person to uh, solo with uh, Boston Symphony as uh -huh. a pianist and all these different things and he was the most humble person I ever talked to. He was just like, yeah, it happened. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, what? Are you kidding me? He won a Pulitzer Prize, you know, all these things. He's like, oh yeah, my son filled out the application for the Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> I guess I won, whatever. It's, it was ridiculous. But, you know, um, I want to go back to social media. <laughs> and you wrote something recently. Uh, you said, sorry, Seattle. <laughs> oh, never. <laughs> Can I read this? Oh, sure, yeah. But your progressive uh, credentials are losing ground with me. You charge me $7 for a, co uh, for a cup of coffee. Uh, shame me when I don't... Uh, uh, compost. Uh, compost. Yeah. You built 600K houses uh, of green material that I can never afford. And you go on and on. <laughs> uh, what... It's great because I, I like when artists speak up about certain issues, and I didn't read the whole thing, but I'll, I'll definitely put a link. Um, what do artists need to do in today's world as, as, as activists, as leaders in politics and social change in general? Yeah. What, what, what can we do and what are we not doing enough of? Because, I mean, I, I really don't want to get into politics, but you know whether it's good or bad now, it could be better. Uh, we could be in a better place. And it's unfortunate. Uh, it, it, we're not doing enough somehow. We're not doing enough as leaders, especially in the arts, uh, to to speak out against everything that's happening. I mean, it's on it's on Facebook, but do we really? Are we really being proactive and uh, you know uh, doing taking the right steps? And I know we don't have time. We, we yeah. do so many things. What, what can we do? How can we approach this? Well, so the reference you're making in particular is to me something that's going on in Seattle, which, well, all right, so let me answer your question by saying I think that artists of any kind, any uh, you know, discipline, whether it's film artists or musicians or visual artists, we cannot think that we are exempt from being affected by and affecting culture. There was a time when I was younger, and I should have known better, that I thought I, I was above politics. Yeah. I'm an artist. I don't have to, I, I put beauty into the world. So I don't have to worry about those things, right? And I think that I've grown to realize that this is, this is not possible, right? So then the next question is, so I think every artist of any discipline needs to be a human being living amongst other human beings, which means that you are a political person. By the nature of being alive, yeah. you're, you're auto automatically political. Yeah. You don't have a choice. You live in a, in a community, that community has to make decisions. That community is either taking care of or not taking care of its poor. That community is 
got house price housing prices that are putting you know putting people out of work, etc. Yeah. So Seattle, so Seattle is an interesting place to move to, especially from the Midwest, because I think it's a city that is really grappling with its identity. And as an artist and as an educator, I cannot live in this city. I'm going to have to make a decision at some point. My wife and I, the work that we do does not afford us to buy a home when we could in Chicago. Um, I'd have to go really far out of the perimeter to be able to afford to buy a home in the city, right? right? So, um, so I'm renting for now. It's fine. You know, I'm not going anywhere right now. It's great. But I have, at some point, I have to make a decision. Do I move to Tacoma, which is a 45-minute drive? Do I do 45 I 45-minute drive on a good day. yeah on a good moment, right? Yeah. Uh, the public transportation system is not worked out yet. In Chicago, you could live 45 minutes outside of Chicago, but take a train in that gets you in there without any trouble, and you could work on the train. It's great. I did it for many years. That's not possible around here. So there's some problems going on in this city. Yet the city promotes itself as being this really like mecca of progressive, uh, you know, liberal ideology. Yeah. And yet, last week we had the Air and Water Show. And that's what you were. That's, about. What, that's the impetus for. They were flying right over my head to live off of Lake Washington. It was loud and scary, and my kids were plugging their ears. And and um, and I thought, well, here is nothing more than an advertisement for the military-industrial complex, yeah. which is what I think that is. I'm not arguing that we don't need a strong military. I, I could see a reason to have a good military, you know, as a as a major country in the world. This doesn't mean we have to go to the lakefront and celebrate it yeah. <laughs> and sell tickets and corn dogs. Yeah. You know, it it's means that we understand what it's there for and we relegate it to that part of our lives, right? So that was the off my complaint. Yeah. Now, then I will then say to your question, what do, what can musicians do? Musicians need to be aware and speak up and do what they need to do in their own communities. Yeah. That doesn't mean, however, that every musician needs to put that into their work. Yeah. And I have chosen for the most part not to. Yeah. I'm somebody that I feel like in my own work, by putting beauty into the world, I am changing it. Yeah. Now, I'm also going to go to the protest and I'm going to vote and I'm going to do everything I need to do in my community to be a citizen and an activist. But I've chosen to let the concert stage and the recordings that I make to not reflect that as much. Now that said, occasionally it changes. I have a, a new record coming out in a few months, and there's a tune on there called Alton Sterling, who was one of the many black men killed by the police in the last five years. And I was writing this composition, that terrible murder happened, and it was on the news every moment I'm like coming up on my Facebook feed or whatever. And I was so disturbed by it, I just titled the tune, the piece, Alton Sterling. And I played that composition live a couple of months later. And by that time, I could have changed the name of that piece to three other different black men who were killed by the police. And so um, is, that a, is that piece a political statement? No, it's a reflection of being a human being and an artist and being open to what is happening around me. My, I, I have decided in my own life that as a white man, that my art is not necessarily the best place to take on activism. Like, I'm happy to be uh, challenged on that, you know, and people do challenge me, you know, but that's not the place for my activism. My activism needs to come in my community. Yeah. Needs to come from me in my role here at Cornish, you know, which is a cultural institution. So I can, it gives me a little bit of power to go into an organization and say, hey, can I have a meeting with you and talk about this issue, you know, to think about students um, doing work in community and things like that. But as an artist, it's, it, for me, it hasn't been the place to do it. So I think we, that's where the choice has to come. We, and, but we have to seriously think about it. And you said something great, you said community, and that's very important because we forget that we can make changes and we can make differences on a smaller scale. We always want to you know, make it on a bigger scale nationwide, yeah. but we don't have to do that. If we just start making the changes within our communities and our, and our area, it could, it could potentially do big things for the future. And hey, big, you know. I, I'm with you. I, I think, you know... I roll my eyes when big pop stars start taking on like some huge cause, yeah. and they own four mansions in their neighborhood, in their in their city, or you know, 
and, and I'm critiquing a pop star that I know right now. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's um, that you, you're absolutely right. Like it must, I, you know, quoting Michael Jackson, the the man in the mirror. You know, like the the or really that's a quote from Saint Francis. Like let peace reign on earth, but it must begin with me yeah. uh, in my local sphere. Like that means super super local local. Yeah. That means my children. That means my wife. That means my block. That means I live in Columbia City. That means Columbia City. That means Seattle. That means the Pacific Northwest. And it just kind of keeps flowing from there. I agree with you. I, I don't, you know, I don't think um, that I need to make some huge political statement as an artist. I need to go work in a, a soup kitchen. I need to go uh, pick up trash in my neighborhood. Um, I'm a person of faith, and I've been involved with churches for many years. And here in Seattle, I'm involved with St. Mark's uh, Cathedral. It's been a wonderful place to be involved, and that's a super active church. I mean, like I could every day, I could be doing something with that church, like helping the poor, helping the needy. We're a, an open congregation right now, so that the church is open to refugees, and we're doing some like real affronting work against the uh, the current uh, federal administration to say. Sorry, we're not going to follow those no. rules, uh, you know, and uh, it's a welcoming community to all kinds of people. And, you know, that's where my activism comes, um, not so much in what I title pieces of music. Or you, know. you said church. I was not expecting this. I've done maybe 40 podcasts at this point. I could confidently say that more than half uh, would, even if they, even if they uh, you know, attended the church, they would not share with the music public. Sure, yeah. Why is yeah. that, and why did you share? Well, it's uh, it's part of my identity. You know, it's um, I am a person of Christian faith. I'm a person who understands Christian faith as one um, manifestation of the mystery of this life. You know, mm -hmm. and that there are many manifestations of that. Um, and it, it's meaningful to me, and I've it helps me put the world back together in a way that you know. That sometimes you just need to put it back together. Um, I'm interested uh, not at all in the kind of like American version of Christianity. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested in like a radical communist Jew who yeah. uh, who blew people's minds and who was willing to like actually go the extra mile. You know, said that I'd go the extra mile for the people around him. You know that's inspiring to me. Um, I directed music at a church for 15 years, which was incredibly hard work. Um, so. You know, playing music for weddings and funerals yeah. and people who lost children and things like that. That, that put music in a whole new place for me. Yeah. Service music, you know, uh, not about me and my ego and my art, but about what does this music uh, mean, mm -hmm. you know. Um, it's it's so, inspiring uh, listening to you talk about this. Um, I mean, seriously, I'm, I'm, I'm very touched. Oh, good. I'm because good. Uh, uh, I, I wish people were just not afraid to talk about things even if even if it's hard to talk about sure. because in the music world I think I think religion has become in, in, in some circles uh, a tough subject to talk about yeah I agree with you I think because especially within Christendom right now you know if you say that you're a Christian it, it, you get confused of being like some asshole you know, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. who's, who's looking to constrict people yeah. but you know, the history of Christianity did not start in America, folks, and it yeah. did not start with evangelicalism, and it certainly didn't start with Donald Trump. <laughs> you know, like, again, I'm talking about, like, the radical uh, reorganization of the mind yeah. that, uh, that different faith traditions offer, you know, and, and um, I'm interested in all of them. I've been, always been interested in spirituality yeah. and the connection to art making. Yeah. Um, and if you study music, if you want to be a serious student of music, you're going to have to deal with religion yeah. uh, in every culture. Yeah. You know, if you want to study Arabic music, Macam, yeah. you know, you're talking about the Quran. Yeah. You know, if you want to study Western classical music, you deal with the mass yeah. first because that's where everything flows from. Yeah. If you want to talk about jazz, you got to talk about gospel. Yeah. You know, like talk to Charlie Parker about his time listening to uh, to gospel musicians, you know, to church musicians, yeah. Mahalia Jackson, etc. Um, so I, I, there's no escape from yeah. that. Like uh, the connection between music and spirituality is a deep, deep thing. To yeah. I was just reading an academic article about some 
reconfiguration of musicology courses at Vanderbilt University. <laughs> you, you know, something you would think is, has nothing to do with spirituality. And yet I noted that the way they're organizing their musicology courses is around themes, about themes of music related to different musicological uh, research vantage points. One of them is spirituality. Wow. So every student who flows through that music history sequence will spend five or six weeks dealing with the connection between music and religion. Yeah. It doesn't have to be Western, it could be anything. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's there. What does James Falzone do outside of music? You have kids, I'm sure they take up most of your time, <laughs> if not all of your time. Yeah. What do I do outside of music? Um, not much. <laughs> uh, you know, I, at this point in my life, so I'm 45, I'll be 46 uh, on September 1st, and um, this is a time in my life when it's all about work right now, and I'm happy. I'm happy about that. You know, it's and it doesn't mean that I I don't have fun. Like my son and I were out throwing a football around last night, you know. But um, but I mean, like everything is revolving around this work, this sense of calling that I have about this work. So I, you know, I I don't. There's no hobbies. There's I, I don't like go. Oh, I'm gonna go do some woodworking or whatever, you know. Um, the only other thing that comes to mind to answer your question is that I'm a serious cook. Like, I love to cook. I have loved to cook for a long time. And I read cookbooks incessantly and read cooking magazines and things like that. And so that, that is a sheer, like, joy. Um, but even that is somehow connected to my work as, as an artist, you know. Um, I'm, I think of cooking as a kind of, like, way of improvising. It is, though. Oh, it totally. Is. Yeah. yeah. I mean, a recipe is just a, it's a score, but I'm not interested in the score. I'm interested in what happens when I, I, uh, when I digest the score and then make my own score. Yeah. So, um, yeah, right now my life is about work and about family and about uh, you know, supporting my children and my wife and enjoying the time with them and enjoying what it means to see them growing and the, the miracles that, that, are, that they are. Yeah. Um, and you know, we get to go out hiking and get to go to the to the lake yeah. and the ocean and things like that. Um, but you know, I'll be honest that no matter what I'm doing, music and these things that we've been talking about the last hour are right there. Yeah. You know, they are they're always a part of what I'm doing. If I'm at the lake with my kids and I hear the water lapping against a pier, there's something interesting in that sound wise to me. But I can still hang out with them and throw the ball around, but be going that's a cool rhythm. Yeah. What can I do with that? You know, so and you probably go the same way. Like, um, there's no escaping this. It's it's all around us all the time. Um, so I, I probably could use a hobby, and maybe one of these days I'll find one. But right now, it's just a joy to wake up and have be involved in this work. Yeah. And um, and it's frustrating at times. It doesn't go as fast as I want it to go. Yeah. And I wish people would change faster. And I wish things would make more sense. And I wish I would be more efficient and etc. I wish I would have, you know, uh, people, who, going back to our earliest part of our conversation, I wish that people would understand more, and that I wouldn't have to educate as much. Yeah. You just think, why, why don't you get this? But, all right, let's, it doesn't yeah. matter, let's, let's go back and let's keep talking, you know. <laughs> well, it's been an absolute honor, and you're an inspirational person. Oh, I, I really goodness. appreciate you talking to me. and. You know, I, I, I read about people before I ask them to uh, join me, and, and you have an absolutely uh, amazing career in everything that you do, from the different ensembles you're involved in, and playing, and teaching, and, you know, leading a big, you know, music department. Yeah. And uh, it's really inspiring to see, hopefully I'll be where you are at some point in my life, because, mm -hmm. because I think that, you know, what, what you do is truly... Uh, the, the future of what we should do as musicians, really be involved in all these different aspects of music and also be outspoken and share your ideas because you've done a lot of interviews, I noticed, when I was yeah. uh, re yeah. reading about you. Yeah, I, yeah, I, you know, Italian guy from Chicago, you, outspokenness is just part of the game. Like. <laughs> That's great. I, I, I think, I think we, we, need to, we need more people like you. Well, thank you for saying all that. Um, and I think it's really about being articulate, right? It's really about... There's a phrase, uh, going back to the New Testament, there's a phrase of like saying, you know, having a, uh, 
having a reason for hope. Yeah. You should be able to like say why you're hopeful about yeah. something. And uh, I guess that's how I feel about explaining these things and talking about my work. It's like, there's a reason I'm doing this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and if you want to talk about it, let's talk about yeah. it. Right? And I won't just say, oh, you know, whatever, it's all the music or something. <laughs> like, you know. So thank you so much for the time and for your interest yeah. and for all those kind words and for all the work you're doing. I've yeah. looked up all the stuff you're yeah. doing. And it's wonderful to be doing it with a, a Cornish grad yeah. and to know that you were here and that somehow this place influenced you. Yeah. And, um, so well, thank you so much. Hopefully I'll have you on at some point again because love it. I, loved, yeah. I loved everything you were saying and we could go on for a couple more hours. Yeah, let's do it. Thank you so much. <laughs>